Ethiopia is one of the oldest sites of human existence known to scientists. Over the generations, many different factors have played a significant role in its formation. Today, Ethiopia is Africa's second most populous country with over 80 million people, 84% of them living in remote rural areas. And despite its rich history and the stoic determination of its people, it's still one of the most underdeveloped countries in the world, but with the fastest growing economy. The last two decades have witnessed some significant changes, particularly in maternal and child health. 20 years ago, the maternal mortality rate was uh, very high, more than 1,000 per 100,000 live births. And under five mortality was also uh, very high and above the sub-Saharan uh, countries average actually. But now the two indicators are much better and even below the sub-Saharan uh, average. Importantly, these gains have been seen in all parts of Ethiopia, due in no small part to a strong political will. You know, the health sector was the most ignored sector in the two previous governments. But uh, since the new government, the APRDF, that government got formed in 1991, health has become a central uh, program of the government. You know, what you can see is that in the last 20 years, you know, with that political will, very ingenious and uh, innovative programs were developed on the basis of the understanding of the reality of the country, the context of the country. So the difference is we have invested the past 20 years in primary health care, which is key in really taking health services to the grassroots, to the communities. This focus on primary health care has led to some remarkable gains. Over 90% of the population now has access to primary health care. In 2011, one government-run primary health centre served 29,000 people, down from 105,000 in 2007. The number of outpatient department visits has increased correspondingly, and there has been a considerable increase in immunisation rates. But how has Ethiopia achieved this progress? This was one of the key questions asked in the Good Health at Low Cost book, edited by London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. We find that countries that have pursued continuously particular health policies tend to be more successful and um, it is important to also ensure that these policies respond to the needs of the population. So sometimes NDGs or internationally agreed targets are not the best thing for one particular country. We have to think about context. From the early 1990s, the Ethiopian government recognised the key role that must be played by health improvement in the country's economic development. At the heart of their strategy lay intersectoral action linking health to progress in other sectors. Health has to be embedded in a bigger agenda to improve development. So while it's vital to improve health outcomes, you also have to look at educating your women, making sure agricultural development's concentrated on, and the importance of water and sanitation. So health is one component, albeit vital, in a bigger picture. The foundation of the intersectoral action was the government's drive towards decentralisation, and determined efforts to promote community participation in development. At the community level, I think there's this historic uh, example that even when it was a more of a socialist country, that you had committees at this level that were very proactive in shaping how the community operated. So there's already those tiers or those systems or those structures in place whereby you are part of something bigger than just yourself, your household. You feed to your community, which then feeds up and further and further up. Community ownership is the central part of our, uh, not only health uh, systems or the health sector, but for our uh, government. And we try to ensure community ownership in order to have really good impact. We try to increase the awareness of the communities and try to understand the behavior, religious or cultural beliefs, and try to address those uh, behaviors and mobilize communities around a goal that uh, we want to achieve. In terms of health, the greatest manifestation of community ownership in Ethiopia is the Health Extension Programme, 
which was designed with input from key stakeholders in the environment, water and education. The Health Extension Programme is an innovative, community-based programme with the aim of creating a healthy environment and healthy living by making essential health services available at grassroot level. The Health Extension Programme is a typical example of a locally developed model which works across different cultural groups because it does, it does involve the people from uh, all levels and uh, the use of uh, cadres that are locally uh, recruited, that understand the culture, the language, and so on. But the is a minority, and the society is not a minority. It's 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 not a minority. What we see from independent studies is that the Health Extension Programme is helping a lot in maternal and child health. Prevention of malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, environmental and personal hygiene are all in the programme. Community and personal ownership of health is one of the major changes of attitude that is playing a role in making the Health Extension Programme a success. Ethiopia are very much of the idea that improving health is a collective effort. So while the health system can certainly provide treatment and, and preventative measures, it, the onus is also on the individual and the household to make sure that they take full advantage of these services that are provided. And also to make some certain lifestyle uh, choices in terms of the nutrition um, and not always waiting for their remedy, but trying to actually prevent the illness along with the facilities that are provided to them. This is massive, you know, you know, changing the mindset of people within a short period of time is very, very significant because, you know, once it changes the mindset of people that they can be responsible for whatever they want to do, including health, I think this is a big one. Since it was first introduced, the Health Extension Programme has scaled up rapidly. Its success was due in no small part to the training of huge numbers of community-based health extension workers. We trained more than 38,000 health extension workers. We have deployed two health extension workers per village. And these health extension workers are teaching our communities on how to promote their health and prevent disease transfer skills and knowledge so they can produce their own health. So we have already implemented it, but we have to really work hard to really uh, use the full potential of the cells extension program that was meant actually to enable communities to uh, produce their uh, own health. The strategy is that as a health post, which is in the village, the health post should focus on teaching the people on health and disease prevention, environmental sanitation, and then family health. So the health extension workers or working in the health post live with the people. And the health center also works on prevention, but also does treat patients. So it is a service delivery chain. Prior to the health extension program, it was extremely difficult, if not impossible, for people to get any health services at all in the rural areas. There was very limited access to family planning, to clean and safe water, to immunization, to treatment for common childhood illnesses. That those services either didn't exist or they were very far from where people lived. And so now people have those services right in their communities. A crucial ingredient making the training within the Health Extension Program successful is task shifting. Task shifting is taking one task that one health worker does, perhaps a doctor, and moving that task down to a lower level uh, provider so that the doctor's time is freed up for emergencies uh, or critical skills that only they can provide. For instance, caesarean section is traditionally or normally done by uh, surgeons, proper surgeons with, you know, uh, general practice initially and then specialize in surgery. But now we're training non-physician clinicians for three years to acquire that, that skill. So we're shifting 
that category, Caesarean section for instance, to our health officers because we don't have enough uh, surgeons. I think task sharing and task shifting in this country have been tremendously successful, um, especially when you were talking about the primary preventive health care, uh, such as immunization. For instance, prior to the health extension program, immunization was always done at a health center, uh, and it meant that people had to travel a long way to get, uh, to get immunization. Or it was done in campaigns, which meant once or twice a year they would have access to immunization. Now that they have shared that task with a health extension worker, people can get immunizations for their children in their communities or very close by to their communities and they can get it at any time during the year so that is greatly improved coverage of immunization in this country. Although Ethiopia spends more per capita on health than World Health Organization recommendations, 16.1%, it still has a long way to go before, for example, it can ensure universal free access to health care for its population. Our government uh, is committed to uh, achieving universal access to all uh, communities. That's the equity issue. And we have already built one health post for 5,000 population, which mainly focus on health promotion and disease prevention. And also we have built health centers, one health center for 25,000 population, which mainly focus on basic curative uh, services. So fulfilling these two, the first line, the uh, health post, and the second line, the health center, uh, makes the access to primary health care complete. Resource is a major challenge because the, the country is so ambitious, the government is so ambitious that it, it wants to do so many things at the same time. And the health sector has been very much dependent on uh, funds coming from you know, global health initiatives like Gavi, Global Fund, PEFA, DFID, and other European countries. A recent study reported a decrease in government funding for health between 2002 and 2006. While during this same period, Ethiopia benefited from a rise in international health aid. It has been estimated that between 2003 and 2009, Ethiopia received over 4 billion US dollars from international funding partners. Donors like a success story, so what they have found when they invest in Ethiopia is programs such as the Health Extension Plan come about and show immediate benefits and immediate health gains. Further substantial funding has come from United Nations organisations, the Gavi Alliance, formerly the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunisation, and bilateral development agencies, in particular those of Ireland, Spain, Italy and the Netherlands. A great deal of these funds have been provided to the health sector. Development partners, like the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, and the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, have also supported the training of health extension workers with technical support from World Health Organization. I know that we do bring quite a bit of resources in. Uh, in 2011, I think our budget is about 300 million that we're bringing in. A large part of that is for HIV AIDS, but uh, it also supports health system strengthening, so it's supporting the entire health system. Strong leadership in the Ethiopian government means that it has the confidence to plan for its people and not blindly follow various donor preferences. They're not a passive uh, recipient. That certainly came across during my visit and during the interviews and in the wider literature. It seems that the Ethiopian government have a plan. Um, they are very proactive in getting all the donors around the table. This is a government that knows exactly what it wants to do. It's ambitious and bold, and they are not afraid of uh, helping direct and form what donors are doing and to say no to uh, programs and, and activities that they don't want. And we, I really appreciate that. I think that's, uh, that's the way it ought to be. Just over two decades ago, the situation in Ethiopia seemed hopeless. Ethiopia, for example, in the 1980s, Ethiopia was a disaster. We had the pictures of death and suffering brought into our television screens every day. They have achieved a huge amount with the health extension program, with 
people with basic skills uh, now spread out over the entire country and they're making major inroads into maternal and child health, into sanitation, into the management of basic infectious diseases. Ethiopia may still have a long way to go, yet many things have undeniably improved. While there are rightfully doubters and critics of what the, the government has achieved um, and the Ministry of Health, but there's no denying there have been these huge health outcomes over the last 25 years. The interesting thing to watch out for going forward is how the government is still going to maintain this balance of control over where it wants the country to go, but still not stifle um, the freedoms and the voices of those that doubt what it's doing and maybe criticise it a little. And it's striking this balance that um, I think will be important to look at in the future. The Ethiopian experience shows that taking the community as a potential producer of health, rather than as a potential consumer of medicines and curative services, is a way forward to achieve better outcomes in health. We open our mind, see for alternative options, but there is always a way if you're really committed to look, look for alternatives. And that's what is the guiding principle of our uh, government to do anything to have equitable services and have innovative uh, practices at the grassroots. <laughs>